Let's open our Bibles this morning or navigate on your device to Revelation chapter 19. Hard to believe we're almost through the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Seems like just yesterday we started. I just want to keep teaching it over and over again. It's so rich and wonderful. Revelation 19, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. The topic we're going to find there, all God's saints rejoice at the final destruction of the harlot who for 6,000 years used the earth as her brothel. The title of our message, O Brothel, Where Art Thou? (laughs) Let's pray. Father, thank you for our morning thus far. What a joy to be here with other believers and perhaps seekers, Lord, those who are here by your invitation to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. To know, Lord, that you loved them so much that you came as a man and died for them and rose from the dead. To realize that you're in heaven, poised and ready to come again. First to resurrect and rapture the church, but then in your second coming, Lord, to make all things right. I pray that we would hear your voice today. That we would be those who have ears to hear what the Spirit says to us as the church. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, Amen. I'm going to start a sentence. I want you to fill in the blank at the end. So this is a for real participation, okay? I'm inviting you to participate. So it's a one word. I just want one, well, whatever you think at the end of this sentence. And so are you ready? Okay, here it goes. The world is a... You are worse than first service. No, but I, I, no one has the right answer. Uh, there's not a right answer, but maybe if I did this. But for me and for you, the world is a... All right. War. The 1973 song and the best-selling album of the year. I was never a big war fan, but I do find myself singing their songs quite often. How many of you remember AM radio? Is there still such a thing? Do cars come with AM radios anymore? Yeah, I guess they still do. Does anybody use them? No. Ghetto, by the time we are done looking at our text, I hope you will see that a better and more biblical answer is the world is a brothel. A brothel is a place where people come to engage in sex with prostitutes. In verse 2, we're going to read, God has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. Quite a metaphor. The harlot was identified in chapter 17 and 18 as Babylon. She is both a religious system opposed to God and the capital city of a kingdom in rebellion against God. We're told that Babylon, the harlot, the prostitute, has corrupted the earth with her fornication. The entire earth throughout history in each succeeding generation has been her brothel, even though when there has not been a capital city of Babylon, still there has been the influence of religious Babylon Uh, And we saw that back in chapter 17. And the entire earth throughout history in each succeeding generation has been influenced by her. Thus, the world we live in today is her brothel. Guess what, though? Jesus picks his bride from out of the brothel. We're going to see her made beautiful by the Lord at the marriage supper that he will host for her. I'll organize my thoughts around these two points. Number one, you've been removed from the brothel to be the bride Number two, you're to rejoice in the betrothal and be becoming as the bride. So verses one through six, remove from the brothel to be the bride. Now we're going to attend a marriage supper in verses seven through 10. But before our wedding supper, we're having to attend a funeral. Verse one, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. After these things looks back over the first 18 chapters of this remarkable book. It looks back on the risen Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 1. It looks back on the revealing of the church age in chapters 2 and 3. It looks back on the rapture and the reward of the church in chapters 4 and 5. It looks back on the seven-year tribulation on the earth in chapters 6 through 18. I've been telling you throughout that the revelation is quite orderly. It's even chronological as it presents the future. It ties together all the loose threads of Bible prophecy into one coherent unit. 
folks who say that it's almost impossible to understand, you can't follow what's going on, are not giving the book a proper reading. John gives an, uh, 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 an outline for it in chapter 1, verse 19, and then the book follows a very orderly chronological um, system. There are some breaks, as we've seen, where additional detail is given, but you can really see Bible prophecy come together in this book. Some of the theologians say that without the revelation, you can't make sense of the various prophecies in the Old Testament because they'll be scattered and peppered here and there. Sometimes thousands of years will be uh, crossed over or passed over by a comma. But when you get to the revelation, John is given this beautiful picture of how everything comes together to the return of Jesus Christ. Now we learn here there's a great multitude in heaven. Obviously they're all the saints of the church age from the day of Pentecost until the resurrection and the rapture. There are also multitudes of believers who were justified by faith in the Old Testament. And there are the martyred of the tribulation. It says here that salvation belongs to the Lord. It is His salvation And it's offered freely by grace to all men, seeing that Jesus is portrayed in Scripture as the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. Will everyone be saved? No. Could everyone be saved? Yes, because Jesus' death on the cross, he said, if I am lifted up, talking about the cross, I will draw all men to myself. Though we are dead in trespasses and sins, there is a power in the cross that can free the will and draw men to Christ, bringing them to a point of decision. He is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. When you believe, his salvation is given to you freely and you are born again. We can too easily forget that glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. So much is wrong with the world. It overwhelms us. I saw a cartoon this morning on a, uh, uh, it was, I wasn't on the website, but it was a repost from an atheist website. It shows God at a chalkboard with a one, two, three, like, and the number one was create the world. Number two, give Gene a tumor. And number three, he was scratching his head. And the idea they were trying to get across is, if God is God, why does he allow things like that? If, and all. And, and, you know, that's the way people look at the world. It overwhelms us. But when we get to heaven, we'll understand that God was in charge and that all things really did work together for the good of those who love him. I'll have more to say about that in just a minute. Verse 2, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And so the Lord is trying to give us an analogy, a metaphor, an illustration. He's saying, my love for you is so intense and it's so pure that when you disobey me, when you sin against me, when you uh, go after idols, when you do anything that is short of my perfect will for your life, it's as if I, as the bridegroom and you as the bride, it's as if you're cheating on me. It's as if you're committing adultery. It's as if you're fornicating. And, And it's something we can relate to, is it not? I mean, certainly you don't go into a relationship hoping that your spouse will uh, sin against you and rebel against you and all. And so God says, this is what it's like. There's a harlot out there who is seducing you to fornication and you need to keep yourself pure. And these two verses really summarize chapter 17 and 18 because there we saw God burn Babylon, both the religious system of chapter 17 and the rebuilt city of chapter 18. And so this sort of is her funeral. I said we were attending a funeral, and it's the funeral of Babylon, and these are some comments from heaven that are being made about the end or the demise of Babylon. It says here, true and righteous are his judgments. God has the reputation of being haphazard in his judgments, or uh, in terms of the cartoon that I just referenced. But we live in a fallen world. These aren't God's judgments. When the things that happen to people don't make sense and good people and young people suffer tragedies and the wicked prosper, those are not God's judgments. We live in a fallen world. Sin is responsible for the seeming haphazardness we witness. God is working through history to redeem and restore His creation. It's a kind of cosmic blame shifting, really. God created a perfect world. He put our parents in a perfect situation. And he said, it's up to you. Make a choice. 
And they chose badly. They chose horribly. It's the worst choice of all time. And we are suffering the consequences of that choice. In the meantime, God from the very beginning said, I am going to overcome your bad choice. And as we read the Bible, we see the unfolding drama of his redemption. We see that he has promised to come into our situation, born of a woman, and to take our sin upon himself and give us his righteousness. And something like that takes about six or 7,000 years, it turns out. It's not something that can happen overnight. And in that time, God is long-suffering with sinners, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. But a lot of terrible things happen at the hands of sinners. God, by His providence, sees that His plan is moving along, but because sin was allowed to come into the universe, God not being the author of sin, a lot of terrible things happen. Now, God could stop that immediately. But I think we see now that we've studied Revelation what the cost would be when God decides that his long-suffering ends and he's no longer going to strive with sinners. It cuts off opportunity for millions of people to get saved and end up in heaven. If the Lord had ended his long-suffering and started the tribulation in 1978, I wouldn't have been a Christian. Many of you wouldn't have been saved. Where would you be today if the Lord decided to pull the trigger on his long suffering and end this thing, you wouldn't be saved. You might be damned. And so might millions of people. And so the Lord is long suffering and we wait. His long suffering won't always wait. And we're reading about here in the Revelation that once this tribulation begins, it's on. And he will bring it to an end, a beautiful end, a righteous end. But in the meantime, it's just silly to blame God. Let's say you remove God from the equation. Now what are you left with? You're left with the absurdity of human life. I studied that when I was in college, and it was called existential philosophy, and they gave it a big name, and a bunch of smart people talked about it, but it was stupid. So they remove God, say there is no God, or it doesn't matter if there's a God, there's just human beings. Guess what? They still act the same way. They still shoot each other and stab each other and cheat on each other and, and do horrible things to each other, but now there's no hope whatsoever. And there's not even any reason to get any better that they can give other than you might as well. It's, it's kind of silly. So you want to remove God from the equation, go ahead. You're going to be worse off. You're going to end up killing yourself because there's really nothing to live for if there isn't God. When God does judge, he's always true to his holy and loving nature. His judgments are always just right. Now, normally at a funeral, the guests eulogize the deceased. Even if he or she was a terrible person, you try and say nice things. Be honest. Have you ever gone to a funeral and you know there's going to be an open mic? The pastor's going to say, if anybody would like to come up and say a few words, you're thinking, what could I possibly say about Gene that would be nice? The guy was a jerk. You know, he did it. And so people come up and, and they say the strangest things. You know, they, they pick out some you think, really? That's, that's what you remember? And almost always somebody says, he died doing what he loved, no matter how he died. Uh, and, and so it's a struggle to say something nice. When the deceased is the harlot who has corrupted the earth for centuries with her seductions, you come up to the microphone and you say, hallelujah, Babylon is dead. Let's rejoice. This is a funeral party uh, that precedes our wedding supper. It says her smoke rises up forever and ever. That's a way of saying that her destruction is final. As we'll see in these last chapters of the Revelation, the Lord will settle everything in the universe. There will be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, certainly no more death. No seductress will rise like a phoenix from the ashes of Babylon to trouble us ever again. Babylon has influenced human history throughout the 6,000 or 7,000 years we've been here, but she will end. The world is quite seductive, is it not? That's a, a good way of looking at the world if you're a Christian. It's perhaps more seductive than ever now that technology has advanced just as morality has completely collapsed. I mean, pretty much th there's almost no standards of morality in the world anymore. It's an everything goes kind of world and it's rapidly declining. Um, and at the same time, we have more opportunity to sin than ever before. 
Verse 4, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. The 24 elders is the name given to the church after it is gathered to heaven in this book. We did a detailed study of this back in chapter 4. We showed how the number 24 is a representative number in scripture. We showed that these elders must be men and not angels. And we showed that the most likely representative group of men in heaven at that time was the resurrected and raptured believers of the church age. The church, you and I who are believers, are, we are raptured and rewarded prior to the tribulation. The four living creatures are a class of angels who lead the worship around God's throne. We've seen lots and lots of worship around God's throne. Worship isn't an event so much as it is an expression of what is in our hearts. Now, we come together and have worship events. In a sense, and Sunday morning is a worship event as we have the worship team come and lead us in praise. But really, it's a time for us to express what's in our hearts. Uh, and whatever the reason, when opportunities arise to worship the Lord, and take the, uh, we should take them and use them. Now, you've noticed probably that, I don't know if you've been to many churches, and some churches do this and some don't, but we don't usually do too much exhortation from the worship team or from the uh, pulpit in terms of your worship. We don't like to look at you and say, that was really lame worship this morning. You guys can sing better than that. I didn't see anybody's hands lifted up. Blah, 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 blah. Those kinds of things. We just, I, I figure you're an adult. And we're here, we present a worship experience for you, you can enter in. Plus, I realize that there are always people, they just barely drug themselves to church. I, I mean, this is going to sound funny, but there are people who, they're like, should I commit suicide this morning, or should I go to church and give this one last try? Maybe God will meet me at church. Maybe there will be some meaning or some purpose to my life. And then they get to church and everybody's singing, and guess what? They don't feel a lot like singing. They're, they're barely hanging on, and then somebody looks at them in a sense and says, what a lame worshiper you are. You're the worst worshiper on the planet. You call yourself a worshiper. You should be ashamed of yourself. Yeah, hold that thought. My gun is loaded in the car. It happens. And so it, you're an adult. Having said that, worship does give us an opportunity to judge our own heart. If I'm in a group of people and everybody seems to be worshiping the Lord and I'm not, I don't feel like it, I'm apathetic, I'm indifferent, it's a heart check. The Lord is saying, hey, what's going on in your life that is keeping you from entering into a worship experience? It doesn't mean you have to sing louder or raise your hands louder. I mean, we could be just as fake doing those things, but it's an opportunity for us to, to have a heart check and to let the Lord spend some time with us and, and to realize that we were created for His pleasure to worship him and to ascribe to him his worth. And so verse five, a voice came from heaven, or excuse me, from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. All is an important word. We've just seen the church and certain angels in heaven. There are others there too. This puts us on notice that God distinguishes between different groups of his saints. The 24 elders are distinct within all of his other servants. And so we're fond of telling you that God distinguishes between the nation of Israel uh, and the church. And so in the Old Testament, when you read about Israel, you're not reading about the church. And in the New Testament, when you read about the church, you're not reading about Israel. And then there are Gentile nations, and there's these other groups, and God deals a little bit differently with all of them. Salvation is always the same. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. There are not different ways of getting saved. There's one way to God through Jesus Christ. But God has different programs, different plans for different groups. And as we'll see this morning, we are the bride of Jesus Christ. Verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Four times in six verses, someone says, Alleluia. It means praise the Lord. This is its only occurrence in the New Testament. It's kind of, it's fun to say that because I would have thought that this occurs all over the New Testament. But it's only here as we're right at the end of all things, just before Jesus Christ comes back, praise the Lord. By the way, Alleluia is a uh, 
It's a fantastic word. It's uh, one of the only, or maybe the only universal word around the earth where if you say it, people know what you mean. When we were in communist China in the 80s, one of the things they told us is that if you get separated or lost or whatever, uh, just go to a public place and every now and then just say hallelujah. And sooner or later, a Christian would come up to you uh, and recognize that you were uh, an American who was lost in China and needing help. And uh, you don't want to be lost in Beijing, let me just say that. Not in the daytime, not at night, uh, not ever. Uh, but anyway, so every few minutes I would just say, hallelujah, just, just to make sure, even though, and they would say, Gene, we're not lost, we're all together, everything's fine. Oh, okay, but anyway. I especially like it being paired in verse 4 by the church with Amen. Amen is a word of agreement, sometimes translated so be it. And so amen, alleluia is kind of like a rallying cry for us. No matter what's going on, no matter what happens, we can say, Lord, so be it. Praise the Lord. We know how it's all going to end. uh, And we're a part of that glorious end. Now, there's a sense in which we should think of the world around us, wherever we are, as if we were in the red light district of Amsterdam. It's the most famous red light district in all the world. According to one source, and I quote, it is the largest and best known red light district and consists of a network of alleys containing approximately 300 one-room cabins rented by prostitutes who offer their sexual services from behind a window or glass door typically illuminated with red lights. And now it's sad to read that Amsterdam's red light district is a huge tourist attraction even if you're not seeking sex. It's like their version of going to Disneyland. An official Amsterdam tour site, this is an official site, it says, another familiar image of the Amsterdam red light district is packs of men, young and old, couples holding hands and pointing in shock, giggling groups of women celebrating a hen night. Somebody will have to explain to me later what a hen night is. It might be a bachelorette party, but I'm just, this is in context. And busloads of Japanese tourists toting cameras. And then they conclude by saying, this is proof enough that the red light district deserves a visit, if not a look in. What kind of nonsense is that? Hey, we have a bunch of prostitutes naked in windows. You should come see that because it's famous. Yeah, let's not and say we did. If you've been removed from the brothel, you're you're now the bride of Jesus Christ, as we'll see in a minute. It certainly doesn't deserve a visit back, you know, to the brothel or even a look in. Having set our mind to the plow, let us plow straight without looking back, forgetting the things that lie behind. We press forward to the things that lie ahead. The world is still a very dangerous, temptress, and seductress. And what we're to see this morning is that we have a magnificent, beautiful, handsome bridegroom whom we should keep ourselves ready for and that anything short of him is really silly. It's really stupid. And and we're not silly. We're not stupid. Now, we want to rejoice in the betrothal uh, as and be becoming as the bride. That's the point of verses 7 through 10. On the night prior to his crucifixion and death, Jesus made an incredible promise to his closest disciples and by extension to all of his future disciples. You know this. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And then Jesus said this, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, very familiar, but there's something in Jesus' words we may not catch, not at first, if we're Gentiles, if we're not Jews. This idea of going to prepare a place, then returning to receive you, only to then return together to the Father's house, this is a Jewish betrothal and wedding. And so Jesus is telling these guys that, yes, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to be crucified, but I want you to think about it as if I am your bridegroom and you are my bride, I'm paying the the price 
and then I'm coming back for you and we're gonna be together forever. And, and, and so, do you understand? It's, it's really an amazing picture. While they're all crying and sorrowing and wondering where Jesus is going, he says, think of this as our wedding. And this is the price I have to pay. But I'm coming back for you, like a bridegroom. You won't know when, but I'll fetch you and we'll go together to my father's house. Marriages in those days were by arrangement of the parents. That's not to say love had nothing to do with it, but there was a lot more involvement with family in a tribal culture than we would have today. The first step in a Jewish wedding was for the father of the groom to arrange a match with the father of the bride and pay him the bride price. From this point forward, the couple were considered legally married. They could only break the contract with a divorce. Afterward, there was a betrothal. It lasted for at least a year. It could last a lot longer if, for example, the arrangement was made when the bride and groom were children. During the betrothal, the bride was prepared to be a fitting or a becoming wife. She was not to behave unbecomingly. It was also a period of time in which she was observed for her purity, which is why the betrothal always lasted for a minimum of a year. It allowed at least a full nine months to pass to make certain that the bride was a virgin at the time of the betrothal. The bridegroom would busy himself preparing a place for the couple to live. To increase romantic anticipation, the custom was for the bridegroom to come unannounced for his bride. On the wedding day, the bridegroom would fetch his bride back to the place he had been preparing. And so the bride had to be in a constant state of readiness. Now that we understand it, we see even more going on. We see that the marriage customs prefigure the Lord's return for us. God paid the price for the bride, and it was nothing less than the death of his son. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only begotten son. We're talking about the cross, the death of Jesus on the cross. That's the price that had to be paid in order to create a bride from a brothel. The preparation of the bride corresponds to the church being in the process of being perfected for the groom in his absence. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul the Apostle says of our relationship with the Lord, he says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I espoused you to one husband that I might present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So he sees the entire time of our walk with the Lord as a betrothal in which we are being being prepared to meet Jesus. And then the application of the fetching of the bride is the imminent resurrection and the rapture of the church. Just like the Jewish bride didn't know when her bridegroom was coming back, but had to be constantly ready, so we as Christians need to be constantly ready. In chapter 4 of the Revelation, we were fetched and taken back to the Father's house, to heaven. We're going to emerge from there to return to earth with Jesus and celebrate our marriage with a marriage supper. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. The word marriage is the same one translated marriage supper in verse 9. And so as I understand it, uh, when we are raptured and in heaven, that's kind of like our wedding. And when we return to earth with Jesus, that's the marriage supper or what we would call the reception. The angel remarked that the wife has made herself ready. This is explained by using the analogy of clothing. The lost and hopeless spiritual condition of the human race is often compared to clothing. You know, God wants us to get things. He wants us to understand things. He doesn't cloak things in mystery so that we'll be confused. All of these esoteric religions where nobody knows what's happening and going on. That's not God. He has condescended to us to explain things in very simple language to us. And he says, I want you to think about your salvation in terms of clothing. Zechariah chapter three, let me read you this text. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. This is a brand plucked from the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel of the Lord. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, see, I've removed your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. And so if you were to look upon Joshua, the high priest, you would have seen him in magnificent priestly garments. 
They were elaborate, exquisite garments. He was bedecked with precious gems. The high priest would look magnificent as he performed the tasks of the temple. But he didn't look that way to everyone. You're told in verse 3 that Joshua was clothed in filthy garments. The word filthy, pardon me, but it means smeared with human excrement. Did he fall into a sewage pool rushing to the temple? Lose his footing and fall into a cesspool and still come into the temple? Why would he enter the temple in such stained and spoiled garments? Well, he didn't fall, not Joshua, but Adam did. You're being shown the same man in the same garments from two spiritual perspectives. From the natural earthly perspective, his garments were fine. From the supernatural and heavenly perspective, his garments were filthy. As high priest, Joshua represented and stood for all Jews. Their finest was filthy. Joshua can also be seen as your representative. In a much beloved verse, Isaiah said, we all are like an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. And so the entire human race, whoever you are, however you know, good you think you are or someone else is, if you are to see yourself from heaven's holy perspective, you are standing before the Lord as if you crawled out of a cesspool. I didn't see all of Schindler's list. I, I, I don't know why or why not. I'm not saying anything about it. But I did see the scene where little Jewish children were hiding in the toilet underneath the excrement so that the Nazis wouldn't kill them. And uh, maybe that's why I didn't watch the whole thing. I just I couldn't take any more than that. And so this is what the Bible is saying. I don't want to be gross, but you need to understand how you look to God as a human being in your sin. Sin is not just a, a little thing that we temporarily get involved with. God says, I can't help it. I'm holy. I'm righteous. This is the way it is. When I look at you in your natural state as a descendant of Adam and Eve, it's as if you've just crawled out of a cesspool and you haven't even bothered to clean yourself up. When you're saved... God does for you what he did for Joshua. He exchanges your garments for his own, a robe of righteousness. Isaiah says, I will rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation, covered me with robes of righteousness. Now in Revelation 19.8, it says, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So you have the gown and you have something else, the righteous acts of the saints. Isaiah went on to say, after he says he's covered me with the robe of righteousness, he says, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. And so here's the picture that God's given you. You're granted or given a spiritual robe of righteousness when you receive Jesus as your Savior. If you're not a Christian here this morning and you start to realize what you are before the Lord, a sinner dressed in filthy rags, and you cry out to the Lord and ask Him to forgive you your sins, He's done that. He will take that off of you and give you a robe of righteousness. Afterwards, you have the privilege of adorning your robe by righteous acts as his saint. You don't earn or add to your salvation. You simply earn rewards which will adorn your robe. When the church is resurrected and rewarded, we individually come before Jesus as his, at his reward seat. He rewards us based on our works and especially the motives for them. You can think of these as adornments for your wedding gown. So are you getting the picture? Your filthy garments are exchanged for a robe of righteousness. You're saved. That's your new position before God. God now looks at you and he sees you in Jesus Christ just as if you've never sinned. And then as we walk with him, whether it's a month or 10 years or however many decades that we've been walking with the Lord before death or the rapture, we have the opportunity to adorn that robe with righteous acts to make ourselves as beautiful as possible for the Lord. I desire rewards in order to be as beautiful as possible for Jesus. You know, isn't it wonderful when the bride emerges in her gown with her hair and face all in order with just the right adornment? I mean, you know, we're not materialistic, but, you know, ladies, I mean, you think about that. You're the gown, it has to be just right, say yes to the dress kind of a thing, and what you're going to be carrying, and what you're going to be wearing, and all these sorts of things. I'm a... I watch everything. But anyway, (laughs) 
I mean, and, and, and it's startling. It can be startling when you see the bride. It's like, wow, look how beautiful. I didn't know you could look that beautiful. <laughs> look at what a little makeup can do. I mean, wow, you know. But no, you know what I mean. I mean, everybody, you know, the shoes, everything, you want everything to be just right. That's why all these YouTube videos are so funny when brides are tripping and, you know, falling into water and stuff like that. Because, because that's not the moment you were expecting. And so the bride is beautiful. Now, you know, I'm sure there are settings where it's appropriate, but you don't want to have everybody dressed for what we would consider a normal wedding. Everybody's in nice clothing, the groom is in his tuxedo, the groom's in the bridesmaids, and then have the bride show up in, you know, I don't even know what, Levi's and a t-shirt. Now, I know that would be appropriate in some place, and you're thinking, what's wrong with that? That's what I did. <laughs> There's something wrong with that. Doesn't fit my analogy. You don't understand what I mean. There's no bridal Barbie that looks like that. I mean, you know what I mean? Little girls don't play that way. And, and so that's what we're talking about. We're thinking, okay, now, as the bride of Christ, I want to be adorning my gown. I want to be stunning in my righteousness when I see the Lord. Verse 9, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. This marriage supper will take place on the earth at the beginning of the thousand-year kingdom of Jesus Christ. The church is the heavenly bride, those who are invited guests or the rest of the saved from all time, the Old Testament saints, as well as tribulation martyrs and believers alive in their earthly bodies at the second coming. And so the Lord's second coming begins after he deals with some things that we'll see at the end of this chapter with the rebellion at hand. It begins with the wedding supper. Verse 10, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Cut John some slack. He knew better, but was overwhelmed. The angel quickly corrected him. At least he reacted. Imagine our shock if John had a more conservative response. He just received these great revelations. John was there when Jesus originally said, let not your heart be troubled. I'm going to heaven. I'll come back. And he maybe understood it, maybe not, in terms of the bride and the bridegroom. But he'd come to understand. And now he was seeing that played out in Revelation. You don't want him to just say, okay, okay, all right. Yeah, I've got that. I think I have it. I'll work on it. I'll put it through Evernote. We'll see what comes out, you know. I mean, he's overwhelmed. He falls down before the angel. I'd rather correct somebody's exuberance than try and prod somebody into reacting. It's really hard to get people to react. You feel like you need a taser sometimes, you know? But, you know, again, we're all adults. That's, that's between you and the Lord. But it's always better to rein people in because they're excited. Angels consider themselves our fellow servants. That's pretty amazing. Though from our perspective, they're glorious and do a much better job than we do, they consider themselves with a proper humility. This phrase, of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, is better translated, I am only another servant with you and your brethren who have accepted and who hold to the testimony borne by Jesus. He refers to the Lord as Jesus, his human name. It means to tell us that Jesus in his humanity, he says, is the spirit of prophecy. His coming as a man is the sum, it's the substance, it's the realization, it's the pinnacle of Bible prophecy. As God come in human flesh, he came and he died and he rose and he ascended into heaven and he's coming again as the eternal God-man. This is everything that prophecy is about. As I said in our prophecy update, it seems we are always talking about prophecy. In fact, we are sometimes criticized for doing so. The Bible is one-quarter prophecy. Every church that teaches the Bible ought to average 25% of its time talking about prophecy. And I think that's pretty accurate here. If you're not averaging any time talking about prophecy, then you're not showing people Jesus. It's not prophecy, it's Jesus. Because Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So next time somebody gives you a hard time because you're into that prophecy stuff, you say, no, no, I'm into that Jesus stuff. Because when I study prophecy, I'm looking at Jesus Christ coming and coming again. Prophecy is not some secondary intellectual curiosity. Now, in our culture, 
it's customary to have a bachelor or bachelorette party prior to the wedding. I'm quoting the following from a true story. STDs, broken limbs, lost cell phones, and, uh, cell phones excuse me, and wallets are really as bad as it usually gets, but when way too much alcohol comes into play and people start sticking their heads out of party buses, things really start to go wrong. A Detroit man died from his injuries after he stuck his head out of the emergency exit of a party bus, June 2011. Salvatore Tatulo, 24, was making merry when he stood up to undoubtedly yell a long celebratory woo just as the bus was going under an apparently very low-hanging overpass. They found his head down the road. He was decapitated. Do you really, here's a question for you. Do you really want your future spouse to have a wild, debauched bachelor or bachelorette party? I and mean, we portray this in the movies and on television and uh, in different ways, but is that what you're really going for? When you get engaged, you want to spend the rest of your life with this person, and especially if you're both Christians, you think, okay, this is going to be wonderful. Let's keep ourselves totally pure and just for each other until the night before our wedding, and then just go out and have a debauched time and do all the things that we're never going to do again. No, you don't want that. And guess who else doesn't want that? Jesus. We're called to be saints by the gospel. We're to be in practice what we already are in position. The Apostle Peter said it like this. He's talking to us. He says, He which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of behavior. In other words, act becomingly. You're now the bride of Jesus Christ. You're not in the brothel anymore. You're not to be seduced back into the brothel. You've left all that behind because you have something better. You know, the Christian life is always portrayed as things that people want to do, but God won't let them. Oh, man, I wish I could have that debauched night. No, you don't. No, you don't. And if you do, there's something wrong with you. Some of you had those debauched nights, those terrible nights. You're glad to have been delivered out of them to something beautiful, to something clean, to something pure, to something lasting, to something purposeful. And so that's what John is experiencing. He's saying, we're the bride. And like any bride, we ought to keep ourselves and prepare ourselves and be ready because we have the most worthy, the most beautiful bridegroom of all time. You know, every year, was it People Magazine does the, what is it, best looking or the most gorgeous men or something like that? Jesus ought to be number one every year. I don't know what picture they would use, but he's, he's at the top of that list. Uh, they actually do world's sexiest man, but, you know, it would be the, who is the most beautiful man ever? In, in all that he represents, in all that he is, and, and all that, that he has to say. It's Jesus Christ, and he's your bridegroom. And so, it's not that you have to keep yourself ready. You want to keep yourself ready. Because there's nothing else out there that competes with him. Don't visit the seductress, not even from a distance. Don't do it as a tourist. Keep yourself in the pure love of God. Build your gown. So what's your eye on? What is your spiritual eye on in terms of things you'd like to adorn your gown with? Are you thinking maybe a missions trip? Are you thinking maybe attending a Bible study, starting a Bible study at work? Is there something that maybe has been moving in your heart? That's, that's what we're talking about this morning. Ways of serving the Lord. Is there some, something you need to repent from? Somebody you need to ask forgiveness from? Things that will adorn your gown and make you a more beautiful Christian for your beautiful bridegroom.